Grant. Well, um, just uh, just as we um, as we come to the close of the day, I, I thought uh, there's been so uh, so much energy about the place. Um, I, I've been really um, really pleased with um, going around the groups, hearing all the different ideas, all the discussion that's been had. Um, so really very grateful for um, for all of your contributions today. Um, we thought it would just it'd be useful to kind of um, take a few moments to to whistle through the workshops and kind of think about some of those key key points uh, that were discussed. Um, so I thought the easiest way of doing that would be to um, um, to, to uh, have each of each of our champions who were chairing those workshops um, share share a few of their their thoughts that they feel have come out from the workshops. Um, I mean, as a general point um, for myself, um, I kind of feel there have been some key trends that have developed throughout the presentations and workshops today, um, notably around landscape. Um, I, I think there's been a really nice thread um, that's kind of flown uh, out from, uh, from kind of my comments about uh, the geography this morning in the Highland Lowland Division. Um, and that has really seems to have kind of shaped our um, shaped the archaeology and shaped the historic environment and how we're trying to understand it and also the gaps um, and, the, and our priorities and the, the, those key dis and there seem to be key distinctions coming out from um, from needs to understand within the Highland Zone and and within the Lowland Zone. So um, yeah, I, I feel that that uh, those is kind of common threads. Um, uh, influencing the nature of the record have have kind of come come through all the all the periods, um, so that's been really interesting. Um, from prehistory from the prehistoric sessions this morning, I I um, I he heard some kind of key points about uh, period transitions and uh, issues surrounding them um, and uh, considerations of uh, periodization as a conce conceptual tool. Um, that, that we can be used, but we shouldn't be constrained by it. Um, uh, there are also uh, a need for synthesizing um, to aid gaps in priority identification, notably for the Chalcolithic and Bronze Age and aspects of Roman, such as Roman's uh, roads and rivers. Um, historic research biases, I also thought came out through prehistory um, that have impacted the state of our knowledge. And uh, gaps in the settlement evidence from sort of Mesolithic through to Bronze Age seemed to be a kind of a, a, a key focus which was juxtaposed against the Iron Age um, where quite a lot of focus has been on settlement um, uh, and where we, where we have a gap instead with uh, with burial. Um, so there's a quite, a, quite a, a neat little contrast there between the Meso to Bronze and then, and then Iron Age. Um, uh, and then a kind of across the the whole lot, I was kind of seeing uh, seeing calls for uh, looking at definitional refinement and uh, and real consideration of these transitions between the periods. Um, so I'll, I'll maybe ha I'll hand over to our our prehistoric champions um, and kind of get get their take, and then and then we could take historic after that. Um, so Dean, do you want to comment? I'm going to be very brief. The um the session basically broke down into two parts. The first part was ideas about how we discover uh, the Mesolithic, and there was lots of progress made. I'm grateful to the scribe, which made the job of chairing the session so much easier. And the second part of the, uh, of the session was about what we can do to find out about the environmental history of Perth and King Rossi. It was very pleasing to sit in a room, first time I've ever sat in a room with about seven or eight environmentalists, and I found that really interesting. Um, one thing that did come out was we thought that there should be some cross-fertilization here, especially with regard to the environment. For example, if there were going to be any panel meetings on the Mesolithic, I would really like somebody from the environmental panel to attend, and certainly somebody from uh, the Mesolithic, if there was a, an environmental panel, then uh, somebody from that panel should attend. So, because uh, the, the environmental 
uh, situation ex expands across the whole 15,000 years of Scottish archaeology. It's a, it's, a, it's a very shallow time depth of the archaeology in Scotland. Uh, and it cuts across all disciplines. So I think some cross-fertilization would be very good. Um, has amazed me, apart from all the other work that goes on, is how important the Tayside Landscape Partnership and SERP have been in populating the knowledge of the, of the archaeology of uh, Perth and Kinross. It's been absolutely wonderful. What we know now and what we knew before pre-2006 has altered incredibly. And from a personal viewpoint, um, I'd like to thank um, Becky and AGS for having the courage to, to fund the SURF project. Thank you. Thanks, Dean. I'd like to thank my mother <laughs> and my father for bringing me up, supporting me in this difficult career. Uh, so yeah, so thanks to everyone who was involved in the Neolithic discussion, uh, and uh, I decided to be less cynical during that, that um, period of time, which was useful. Uh, I think that initially we started off with some of the kind of the quite generic issues that are, that are obvious when thinking about the Neolithic period in terms of where were people living, um, where were they being buried, um, kind of actually we have limited evidence for much of the county. But then the emphasis started to shift on to thinking about what it is distinctively about um, the Neolithic of Perth and Can Ross that we can look for as research questions and as key gaps that can then maybe be more useful thinking about the Neolithic across the, the rest of Britain and beyond. So thinking about the, the great opportunities of of having um, upland Neolithic traces, this is a great place to look for it. And if that happened, there'd be implications for the rest of the Neolithic in Britain and other aspects that we've, you know, things like the axe trade and the unique, um, the, you know, the kind of mainland Scotland's unique uh, presence of an axe factory. So there's a lot of kind of concern with thinking about, well, let's not just look at generic questions, which you could ask for almost anywhere um, in the Neolithic in Britain. Let's think about what's specific to Perth and Ross and how that might be useful elsewhere. Um, so that was a really useful line of discussion. And there was also some thought about the, the final destination and use of the uh, framework and how might that feed into, for instance, the, the tendering process, the planning process, and other lessons that can be learned from uh, previous uh, ex excavations and research that we could then feed in meaningfully into the way that people do things in the future as well. So how does the, the framework actually proactively make a difference? So it's quite a focused discussion and something that hopefully can, we can build on in the future. Um, just like to also say thank you to everyone who contributed to the workshop for the Chalcolithic and Bronze Age. Um, our discussion was very much, uh, the, there were kind of two elements to it. The first was um, talking very much about broad level aspects that were applicable, are applicable not just to the research framework for the Chalcolithic and Bronze Age, but perhaps more generally, um, there was a feeling that a, a general cleanup or synthesis or maintenance of data held at museums on the HER in grey literature, the archives, would overall just be very beneficial in, in working towards understanding uh, the Chalcolithic and Bronze Age, but presumably other periods as well. Um, and we also thought a lot about some of the big questions which apply to uh, uh, apply at such a at such a high level, such as where are people living or where are people making things. That what we need are targeted areas to be um, a approaching with the aim of contributing to those bigger questions, which hasn't has more, has a regional contribution and a broader national one. Um, and integral to all of this, it was emphasized that many of these projects that have been done in the past, the most successful ones have been the ones that have utilized the community engagement. And this is something that uh, our session very much focused on as, as something that should be factored into anything that is done in the future. Um, because without the community support, many of these projects don't develop in a meaningful way, not just uh, it's not just enough to ask the academic questions, it's about 
making these questions pertinent to people living in these areas today. Um, and on a slightly uh, cynical note, there was a, uh, quite a concern about money and who is funding all of this. But I'm sure we'll work that out. Uh, uh, in terms of uh, specific knowledge gaps for Chalcolithic and, and Bronze Age um, and future priorities, uh, in, a, in addition to the ones I presented earlier, uh, it was flagged the following up of chance discoveries when that's possible. So a particular case study was the follow up of metal detecting finds that's been done by Trevor Cowie and Mark Hall and utilizing what people are, uh, what people are doing basically as their hobby, you know, metal detecting, um, scoping out rock art sites, engaging with that activity to uh, enhance what we know about this period and in this region. Um, there was also discussion around um, utilizing sediment records. So I mentioned some of the uh, social changes that occurred during this time, but uh, it became clear in the workshop that also what we should be seeking to integrate, as, um, as has already been mentioned, is the environmental aspect and see how what the environmental record might tell us about the social change that's happening, how these two things relate to each other. Um, and I think I'll leave it there and pass on to Michael. So thank you very much to everybody who came to the Iron Age um, discussion. Uh, we had a very robust discussion, uh, frequently about the nuts and bolts of how the framework is actually going to work, in particular uh, for uh, development, uh, pre-development work. and. I think that was really useful um, uh, for me in, in terms of trying to ask the types of questions that we can actually answer uh, out of these frameworks um, uh, with the evidence that we are going to find, um, because we will find a lot uh, as major development work takes place, as uh, new ways of collecting data um, happens, there's going to be you know, volumes and volumes of material that uh, we're going to work with but it's going to be of, of a particular kind. So we need to ask the questions uh, that we can actually answer. Um, it, there's a lot of desire to learn more about the environment and environment climate change through the Iron Age, uh, as there is in other periods. Um, a, it, it's a matter of trying to uh, link something like that up with questions that we can actually answer. Um, so there are gaps, uh, for instance, uh, with the burial record, as there are elsewhere in northern Britain in the Iron Age. Um, and I think one of the things that came out is we need to seize on those rare opportunities that do come up. Uh, for instance, finding out that uh, Inch Tuthil has an Iron Age burial uh, is fantastic. And that's something that uh, I think really needs to be seized upon. So perhaps what goes into the framework is uh, uh, sort of a section or a series of questions um, where you know we can highlight those bits that are really genuine gaps that need to be seized on where and when the evidence becomes available. The the <clears throat> Roman section was also with the Iron Age. I think there's only really two points um, that Michael hasn't touched on uh, for the Roman period: sequencing and dating. Um, there was a bit of debate on on how the relationship between all the Roman sites. Uh, work together and I'm focusing on, on the dating of that and uh, which site came first, where roads go and things like that. Um, I think that was probably the main key point um, that we covered. Uh, also the interaction with the local population and that uh, I touched upon in my, my talk about women and traders and children and a lot of that social data is lacking. Whether that has to be done through synthesis with, with RNH sites and, and finds, or whether we can all start to look for cemeteries, as, as Michael sort of alluded to. I think there's a lot of information there that's still out there that we really need to get so we get a better picture of the local area. Thanks very much. Um, well. It's been a, a very interesting day, and uh, I'm just going to share a few of the thoughts which uh, seem to me the most uh, compelling to come out of our discussions. And I suppose there was a, not surprisingly, quite a um, strong 
feeling that in this region, in Perth and Kinross, we have really great resources which allow us to engage with and address really profound uh, issues in, in the development of Scotland and particularly the, the kind of mechanics of how the kingdom comes together and how, how, how it's shaped and how the institutions mature. So that's something which I, I think was, uh, we all agreed with. W one of the things which um, was drawn out and I think was, is something which we probably really want to emphasize is, is that the, one of the really powerful connections that uh, Perth and Conross has is with the, the looking south and sort of connecting with the fourth. And we didn't really talk about that much, but it is, uh, it does actually kind of take us right into that other environment. So it's not just about the, the uh, Highland uh, Massif, you know, it's, a, it's down into the, the, the fourth valley as well. So that's quite interesting, and particularly because it ties us into the that uh, the that Roman frontier landscape and where social change is starting to take place in the first and second century on a kind of dramatic way. And we spent also a fair bit of time talking about the challenges of working with the settlement archaeology. We've got a lot of it. Um, we've got this very highly visible, distinctive upland uh, material, and we have big problems of sorting out the uh, lowland situation because the visibility is low and the variability. And I think the kind of feeling we got to the end was that that we're kind of maybe need to be more sensitive and more flexible in our handling these uh, sites in the sense that we need to be aware that, that the chronologies which we kind of um, presume that they have maybe Aren't, isn't correct, and and the, we need to take more uh, cognizance of the, the the scientific dating and maybe re revise our understanding of these things so that we can work with that. We also talked about some of the other challenges working in the plow zone, and uh, didn't really come up with any kind of earth-shattering conclusions there. I think that one of the th things which struck me as being particularly powerful as a kind of area of thinking about work and moving forward was the idea of movement and moving movement through these landscapes and how that uh, could be modeled and how that could be investigated. And we've talked about moving using the rivers and the, the waterborne movement. And we also talked about the road systems and how we have these road systems. They're not been really rigorously studied. There's a kind of you know, uh, presumption that they're there, but it would be a really useful area for, an accessible area for communities to participate in. So that was fine. And then we also just talked about our favorite sites we'd like to dig. And I guess we're not gonna kind of run through them just now, but they will presumably appear in the next iteration of this uh, process. Yes, we had a very lively discussion uh, for, for the later medieval period, which we all enjoyed very much, and very little if it is defamatory, so I'm sure it will all be published. Um, a number of really interesting thing, things came out. Uh, I think we, we wondered whether it would be possible to do a, a three-borough study of burial assemblages, Aberdeen, Perth, and Edinburgh, three East Coast boroughs with different compositions, we suspect. That would be rather a fun thing to do. A recurring um, theme was the relationship between urban and its hinterland, the borough and the countryside, and the exchanges between them. The concept of, there was a, a conference some years ago called Provisioning the Borough, and revisiting that topic, and understanding how the borough and its hinterland interact with each other, understanding the networks that connect the small settlements, the boroughs, and the whole area together. We talked quite a lot about the origins of settlements and especially the transition from pre burgal to burgal in Perth itself, understanding how that happened and how that could be investigated. We also spent quite a long time thinking about a problem for the future 
which has been flagged up by several other periods, making the physical archives, the assemblages, and the knowledge base available for future study. There are lots of problems there, making paper archives available, making digital archives available, making physical assemblages available, making them intelligible as personal knowledge fades. So there's a big area there to enable all the interesting research that's possible in the future to actually take place by making sure that the stuff is preserved and preserved in accessible form. I think those were the main points that we flagged up. Thank you. Um, we had, uh, thank you very much, a small but dedicated team of post-medievalists. Um, one of the main things that we uh, thought about was the, was the, the sort of the detail of the landscape and how these landscapes from the post-reformation into the 18th century represent landscapes of change, um, and it's uh, it's written in the in the map evidence uh, and in the fieldwork evidence as well. So that's something I think we, and one of the probably main takeaways is the, is the need for truly uh, interdisciplinary projects, not just multidisciplinary, um, where we can, we need a better understanding of what the documentary records can tell us, I certainly do. We need to include environmental, pali-environmental uh, research um, and building it into the archaeological side thing. Having said that, nobody mentioned artefacts at all, um, so <laughs> maybe we'll just give up on artefacts. Um, working, some of the other things that came up, the under, need to understand how trades link with the, I mean, we we very much focused on the rural communities, uh, but how the trades link with the, the, the boroughs as well, both uh, Perth uh, and Kinross. Um, there's obviously an identification of um, threat to some of our landscapes as well. Uh, forestry obviously will have an impact on some of our upland landscapes, but there's also an identification of loss of historic building fabric in terms of timbers and other historic building fabric that's being lost uh, through um, redevelopments of, of rural settlement sites, uh, so little uh, cottages and things like that. Uh, we're all agreed that we think uh, more work needs to be done on the diaspora, the clans, the graveyard side of things, which we think, uh, again, have, have a, a lot of interest in terms of um, uh, the detailed records that you could get into. Uh, we had almost got through the entire session without mentioning cattle once, which does seem quite odd for one of the, the main uh, droving areas of Scotland, whatever that means and how that manifests itself in the archaeological record. Um, when it came to battlefields, we just said, where are all the dead? Um, lots of artefacts, that's quite good from that side of things. Methodologies, we want to see more a uh, combination of cartographic sources, LIDAR and environmental uh, sources as well. So um, especially with the LIDAR being able to see underneath uh, some of the tree cover that would be quite useful for understanding uh, some of the enclosed pastures and grazing uh, around that. And we thought a nice area to do some field work it would be a big estate with lots of records um, that could all tie together quite nicely with all these interdisciplinary um, uh, uh, investigations. And we reckon Athol is probably where we'll be going. So if you want to come on holiday to Athol, we'll be going. And a big, a big thank you to all the participants at the Modern Workshop. Um, we began with a discussion about graffiti, a particular prolific tagger called Venom is out there putting his or her mark on Perth. Um, then we had uh, much local knowledge uh, about shops, for example, and uh, an excellent sounding photo survey of every street in Perth um, made in 2011, which will be a useful resource for development control, amongst other things, into the future. Um, we heard about Perthshire's role in the war as a transport hub, its secret mica factory, um, the Monax Glass Company, uh, which uh, left quite a lot of archaeological uh, shards deposits in the Tay. Um, will the secrets associated with the war go to the grave, or will instead they be uploaded to Canmore or the ES or the Historic Environment Record? Um, will they be put online? Um, is it uh, for archaeologists to work out what actually interests them? 
should they actually not have um, a research framework imposing on them what they ought to be doing, uh, as somebody expressed uh, in the meeting. Um, will there be um, a value in perhaps using LIDAR data to identify um, illicit still sites all across uh, the county and beyond? Um, but if, if that's done, um, will there be a need for expert analysis? Or have we had enough of experts? Um, so over to uh, Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust, I think, to decide what is the next step. Thank you very much, Mark. And thank you, the rest of the champions. Um, as, as, Quite a good but potentially dangerous line for me to, to say, have we had enough of experts to say thank you very much to our um, our champion experts. Um, uh, from my point of view, I'd just like to express my thanks to you all. Um, I think it's been an incredibly productive day and um, I've really enjoyed your company, so thank you. Um, it uh, gives me great pleasure to hand back now to Mike to send us on our way with some closing remarks. Mike. Hi. Yeah, I'm sure you all agree that uh, today has been incredibly successful and had lots of interest engagements going on throughout the day. Uh, hopefully you've all enjoyed today's activities and, and will take away with you a greater understanding of some topics, but also many more questions that have still to be resolved. The discussions which have taken place will be invaluable in moving to forward the archaeology framework for Perth and Kinross. On behalf of the Perth and Kinross Heritage Trust, I'd like to thank the Project Fund at Historic Environment Scotland and the SCARF team uh, at Society of Antiquaries of Scotland for overseeing the project. Uh, I'd also like to give a special thanks to our PCAF period champions who have put in so much hard work uh, leading up to and during the conference. Uh, the PCAF steering group who have helped shape the project to get us where we are today. I'd also like to give a thanks to the staff of the Station Hotel uh, for accommodating the conference and uh, feeding us so well over coffee, tea and lunch. Uh, also the conference volunteers who have helped out and made, made the conference run so smoothly. Uh, also thanks to uh, Doug Rocks McQueen for recording the day. I'd like to thank uh, all the delegates for your valuable, valuable conference and contributions and for making such a productive day. And last and certainly not least, I'd like to thank Gavin for leading the project so successfully today and also all the hard work he's put in to organise a, a very successful conference. So we'll now move on to what happens next. Uh, the project now entering a year of review where the comments from today will be taken on board alongside more formal contributions and worked up into draft chapters. These chapters will then be made available for further review and stakeholder consultation before being finalised into the framework in the third and final year of the project. In August 21, we're looking forward to launching the framework of the second regional archaeology conference here in Perth. We look forward to welcoming you back for that big occasion and indeed hearing from you between times with your comments on the framework drafts. Just a final plug for the comments cards. Uh, you can either drop them in the comments box at the VKHD stand or if you, if you want to type them up and submit them online, then quite happy to accept it in that format. So I'd just like to uh, close the conference and, and uh, wish you all a safe journey home. Okay. Thanks.